Hideo Iano's Shin Kamen Rider leaps into Japanese cinemas in 2023, and a brand new teaser debuted during the opening weekend of Shin Ultraman. Today, I am joined by my good friend, Josh Knight I, staff writer for Tokusatsu Network, to break down the trailer and converse in depth about this upcoming Kamen Rider reboot. But before we double writer kick the evil forces of Shocker, please like and share this video, subscribe to Monstrosities here on YouTube, and join our Patreon today. It is through the support of viewers like you that allows the creation of videos like this. At base, what Shin Kamen Rider is, is another... They, they were talking about it for years now and trying to get this thing off the ground, but what they were trying to do was make sure that this could be ready for the 50th anniversary, which was just this past year in 2021. So they had been having this in the works for a while. Anno was tapped to go ahead and direct and write this thing since if you've seen Evangelion or if you know anything about Anno as a person, the man lives and breathes Tokusatsu. The whole reason he made Evangelion was because it was his love letter to Ultraman, which is why, you know, he's got his hands in Shin Ultraman. So if you wanted somebody who had a good feel of what the genre is, had a respect for it, has his own hand in directing his own things, telling very grandiose stories. This was the guy you wanted to go to. So Shin Kamen Rider, yes, very much is going to be a celebration of what the franchise originally was. It's a retelling of the original 1971 series. It's a reboot, but at the same time, it's not nearly as stark of a difference as the previous reboot, Kamen Rider the first was back in 2005. I saw this on some Wikipedia, on some Anno Wikipedia, that he dressed up in a Kamen Rider 1 outfit during his wedding. Yeah, that that's him. That's him to a T. Mind you, this is back in the day when cosplay wasn't nearly as accessible as it is today. He had to put in a lot of money and effort to get the first version, which is what uh, this movie's basing the costume off, the light blue leather Kamen Rider suit. He got that uh, to take wedding photos in. That, that man is dedicated to that series. Th those two series had such a vast influence on him, both Ultraman and Kamen Rider, that they've infected all of his other works. We got a trailer, a new trailer for Shin Kamen Rider, and we also got a poster. I wanted to ask you, because this was really interesting about the poster, I'm just gonna bring it up here. Do we know why it's all in English? That I don't know. Nothing was said from uh, Toei Productions as to why they decided to do this. I've been following their social media ever since they launched to see why they did this. But to me, even more so than any of the advertising that was done for Shin Ultraman, this speaks to we want other eyes to see this, not just who's here in Japan. Ano is paying such immaculate attention to detail with this. This pose is not by accident. These are the same poses from the promotional pictures that were done in 1971. He is sticking to the playbook on a lot of this. But yeah, to put all that in English, that makes me think that they've got a plan for distribution. And it, I think it's telling that we saw the first glimpse of this poster the day Shin Ultraman dropped. Didn't the Shin Kamen Rider trailer play with Shin Ultraman? This teaser, uh, I, I feel remiss calling it a trailer because it's only <laughs> 55 seconds of footage. From the bulk of this teaser, from 55 seconds, I'd say almost half of it is based in footage that Anno is shot for shot recreating from episode one of Kamen Rider. There seems to be a very large focus on Takeshi Hongo getting his powers, realizing I'm not human anymore. It's seemingly one of the interesting things that I'm looking at here is that I get the impression that he doesn't have control of his powers, which is a thing there in, in the original show. Like he doesn't know how to master his own strength, but even more so here in the trailer, he's never seen without the costume on. You know, he's covering it up with a trench coat, which is something that drew people's attention to it when we saw the first promo image. Even though they have added that little bit of a costume change, a lot of this footage here of Rider One posing like this before they, you know, stylized it to more of the classic pose, uh, him squaring off against Man Spider or Kumo Otoko, that stuff is shot for shot the way it was back in April of 1971. Now, I gotta ask, at 30 seconds, there is this, like, Cyrax, Sector, Mortal Kombat-looking kaijin. Yeah, uh, Kumo Otoko, or Spider-Man, that would be him. I was very surprised looking at it because when you compare it to the suit that they made for 
Kamen Rider the first, it actually looks quite similar to that aesthetic of instead of being a guy in a spandex suit, they went for a more mechanized look and they seem to have brought that along here. And I, I, it's interesting that you brought that up because as far as we've been told and we see some of it here in the trailer, we have three confirmed kaijin for the movie, which is in English as best the translation goes. We have man spider, man bat, and bee woman which you see uh, sparse throughout here. I was going to say, is B-Woman the one in yellow that's a little bit further down at about the yes. 30 second mark? Okay. You know what? I'm digging the lightly mechanized stuff. I know we don't can't see a whole lot, but I, I kind of like that design. Well, what I think is most interesting about that is that if you look at the 34 second mark, you see the, the back of the head of Man Bat. That is the second villain that Kamen Rider ever fought. One of the, the great tropes that is carried on throughout all of the other series is that more often than not, the first two villains that were fought in the series, which was first Man Spider and then Man Bat, a lot of common writers here will throw back to that. They, in their first episodes, the first villains they'll fight are a spider-themed monster and a bat-themed monster. So that's been a pretty consistent thing over the years. But what's interesting here is we've got the mechanized version of Bee Woman, the mechanized version of Man Spider, but Man Bat here looks kind of like the old 70s version, at least from the back of the head that I can see. So I, I'm interested to see what they're going to do with that specifically, like the look of it. The shot right before uh, Man Bat is of, uh, I believe that is Shinya Tsukamoto, who he's a film director. He directed like Tetsuo the Iron Man, but he's yes. also the guy in Shin Godzilla who's like, Aragami. Dude, the shot at 41 seconds. I'm assuming this is writer Ichigo and Nigo. What's funny, and I don't understand why they decided to do this, but you know, they gotta make do with what they've got. So we knew right off the bat that this was going to be a movie about Rider One, about Takeshi Hongo and his fight against the organization known as Shocker. But what was interesting is that they're going the same route as Kamen Rider the First and the Next, where they're also including Ichimonji Hayato or Hayato Ichimonji as the second writer. You know, if you know anything about the original series, the whole reason he was included at all was because in the original series, uh, Hiroshi Fujioka was doing his own stunts as Kamen Rider up until he had a terrible motorcycle accident, broke his leg, shattered it, and couldn't perform anymore. So the writers had to figure out some way of keeping this thing going. And so they introduce this other character who also happened to become common writer off screen. He introduces the transformation pose into the show and saying transform, saying Henshin. And that's really where the show took off. So he saved that show. And it's important that a common writer story gets told with him in it. But in context of what Ano seems to be trying to do, his arrival is much later and tells a much different story in terms of the kind of show it was because the first part of the show when it was just Takeshi Hongo it's a lot darker it's a lot more grim it's a lot more man I am so lonely I am so sad doing this all by myself and then once you introduce Hayato Ichimonji it becomes a lot more lighthearted. you've got a bigger cast of characters on the side who kind of they're the Scooby gang who get into hijinks uh, getting captured by Shocker every week but I don't see any elements of that here in this trailer, but we definitely see him seemingly doing his transformation pose and putting the helmet on, and then also uh, being there in front of what I believe is Mount Fuji there with Hongo, uh, with both of their uh, their motorcycles. I'm interested to see how they're gonna how they're gonna handle that. Do you think that there's a danger of just cramming too much in movie one? Well, I think the the worry isn't so much the inclusion of Rider Two. I think the worry, at least from what we've been given strictly based off that is that the footage that we've been given is very episode one heavy and if Anno's going to do nothing but recreate episode one and then shove a bunch of stuff together for the next hour hour and a half what have you then i'm going to be worried about it it'll probably be more true to form than the first was and that's not a hard you know fence to jump over but i'm worried how much time he's allotting to everything else because everything we've seen here, if you cut up the footage that we've been given, there's a lot of recreation going on. But that's not the only thing I'm wanting to go see this movie for. I want to see, okay, how do you put your stamp on this? We know this is influential to you, but how are you going to tell your story of what Kamen Rider is? So they're going to have to do something different with Hayato Ichimonji being included there as writer too. There's something in there in specifically what uh, villains that we're getting and the way Shocker's being portrayed that I think is hinting at what we can expect. 
and I think there's going to be a little bit of a, a focus on the mind control aspect of what Shocker's evil plans are. And there's a lot of evidence for that so far. I've heard a lot of theories about what Shocker could be like in this movie. Specifically, there I saw something over on our Discord that was talking about some kind of cult in Japan yes. that uh, seemingly that this might be taking pot shots at. Yes, so uh, speaking to that specifically, so within the last couple of decades, there's been a religion, I'm supposed to say that, but it's very much characterized as a cult uh, that exists over there in Japan called Happy Science, which is very much just like the Japanese kind of Scientology, where it was founded by somebody who professes that they are the one true all-knowing God. They have a lot of media presence, a lot of pull against uh, political opponents there in Japan. Famously, one of the actresses from Kamen Rider Forze uh, quit the entertainment business, uh, changed her name, and joined this organization. And that was a very big to-do over there. They've had a lot of run-ins with press, and getting a lot of bad things about what goes on in there, that it's kind of this hierarchy you have to pay to move up in the organization. And the reason I think that's important to go over is specifically because of the social media for Shin Kamen Rider. We're told that Shocker isn't just the name of the organization, it's an acronym that specifically stands for Sustainable Happiness Organization with Computational Knowledge Embedded Remodeling. So if you take the second half of that, Computational Knowledge Embedded Remodeling, that just sounds like, you know, human transformation, you know, cyborg experiments. That's regular old shocker, but it's the first part here, sustainable happiness organization that makes it sound like they're leaning towards, oh, we have something to say about how this organization operates. And we're also seeing here that shocker has a catchphrase. If you want to be happy, be. That's shocker's catchphrase. Like that doesn't sound like an evil organization, but it sure does kind of sound like a cult. So I imagine that's the angle that they're going to use for this, specifically also because with the inclusion of Bee Woman and Man Bat, those were two villains within the first 10 episodes of the show that relied on manipulation of the mind, of mind control. So when you take all of that together of two villains who used mind control and this seemingly pretty obvious, hey, we're kind of basing this off this cult there, I think that's what they're basing the characterization of the evil organization Shocker off. I think one of the things that I think he's trying to get across is that you have to have some knowledge of what the original thing was to know the message they're trying to get across. So in Godzilla, and then subsequently Shin Godzilla, you have to know that the story here is about this unstoppable force. That's what you're up against. So in Gojira, they're dealing with an unstoppable force that's going through Tokyo, and there's literally not a damn thing you can do about it. Same thing in Shin Godzilla. There's this force that came out of nowhere, came out of Tokyo Bay. It's going through Tokyo, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. With Ultraman, it, it has to do with hope, where, okay, the hope of people is on this thing that's bigger than us, and even though that's fighting the monsters for us, it still relies on the people, like the science squad, but really just regular old people to get in there and do their part. And I think the thing to get across here with Kamen Rider, specifically going into Shin Kamen Rider, is this idea of isolation, of loneliness, because one of the, the key songs there in the original series is Lonely Kamen Rider. This is a man who is taken away from the world around him. And you can see a lot of that here when you're looking through this 55 seconds of footage. He looks removed from everything. He can't take that suit off. He's reminded constantly of who he is. This is his personal war that he's having to fight against Shocker. And thankfully he's got the one person with him uh, who I believe is a proxy to the character of the original show who believes he, that, oh, Takeshi Hongo murdered her father accidentally because she walked in at the wrong time in the episode. But it appears she's helping him out here, which eventually does happen there in the show. But otherwise, it's the two of them against everything. And that isolation is the thing that carries a writer through. Like, this is my burden to bear. Nobody else gets involved. Nobody else has to fight. Nobody else has to die. I got to do this by myself definitely in some of these shots like right here at the 37 second mark you see him solemnly looking down almost contemplating this horrible thing that he's having to deal with not being human anymore i think that's the movie that they're trying to make 
that Anna's trying to make and show this is a lonely hero. It's not the Avengers. It's not even necessarily Batman. Yeah, Batman's a solo guy, but he has team ups. He has partners. He's got Alfred. Common writer at the at the outset, he doesn't have anybody. He barely has one person and one FBI agent to help him out, and they don't help out hardly at all each episode. So this guy is trying to do it by himself, and I think that will appeal to a lot of people going in there wanting to see themselves in this hero, that, hey, this is a guy who's having to do it by himself. Something in that resonates with me. I think that's what's going to appeal to a lot of newcomers to the series that aren't already familiar with what Common Writer is. I'm doing what I can to make sure that I've got my ear to the ground in every single outlet I can that if we hear anything about this getting stateside release, I am there. If it's across the country, I am there. If I can get a new passport and get out to Japan, I would love to be there for when this thing drops. I know I couldn't be there for Shin Ultraman, but you damn well better believe I want to be in on this. I want to be in on the ground floor. I want to be there when I know they're going to play the original theme because we already had, like, again, Anno's attention to detail. He made the lead actor sing the opening theme just like in 1971 where they had Hiroshi Fujioka sing the opening theme. And dude can only sing so well. Like, he can carry the tune in a bucket that's not a big bucket, but at least he's got a bucket. And this guy did the same thing. That was the first footage they put out. And I'm like, I know this song, like the back of my hand. I'm going to sing along with everybody else. This gets stateside release. I'm going to be that annoying dude in the middle of the auditorium being like, Simaru Shoka. That's going to be me. I would like to say thank you to Josh for taking the time to talk about Shin Kamen Rider, as well as to our newest patrons, and I hope I'm not going to mess up these names, Ari Janaj and Hugh Jangus, who have joined up the ranks of Vulture Squadron. Thank you so much to you both. And thank you, dear viewer, for checking out this video and for your continued support of Monstrosities. Until next time, we'll catch you soon. Simaru Shoka Akuma no Kyo